Hello everyone, today we talk about Latin literature from the mid-third to mid-second century BC. It's a great moment of development of the Roman Republic, its expansion in the Mediterranean. And in the history of Latin literature, this is a dramatically important moment, because essentially Rome opens to the Hellenic literary tradition. Uh, it becomes effectively an Hellenistic power and Hellenistic culture, we can say loosely meant, obviously maintaining its in fact Latin character, not a Greek one, but definitely absorbing uh, an, an enormous amount of models of that are scholarly more developed than anything the Romans had uh, come up with at that point, culturally speaking. Um, this would require a, a larger introdu introduction, maybe one day we, we can discuss concerning essentially, you know, how stages of development and civilization also get accompanied with a certain cultural uh, advancement, etc. Uh, here it suffices just to remind that Rome actually was, um, had an, a, a dramatically speedy development in itself, right? The Romans passed in a few centuries previously to this from basically a kind of tribal uh, mindset to effectively a, a highly developed one, one of the, the most advanced civilizations of the time and this didn't go without uh, without aftershocks we can say or better without um, ser characterizing eventually Roman culture and uh, in this case literary production specifically um, with certain traits naturally were peculiar to the uh, Latin uh, Italic world, we can say, and that yet were naturally drawing essentially um, cultural uh, tools and uh, bases from you know m more from civilizations that had had a, 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 a longer development, so they had also sedimented in case of Greece um, an actual tradition, an actual structure, right? Not even ancient Greece technically was ever born like a unitary thing. There were certain areas of Greece that were kind of less developed, that had uh, less advancements, but it's obvious that Rome at this point is being impacted chiefly by not uh, just Athens, but also the uh, certain models scattered in the Hellenistic world in terms of uh, the, the successors, courts, uh, etc. And they acquired in, in very different ways that are to be observed, uh, for example, I don't know, in the development of libraries, something that is quite overlooked is actually Romans um, read more, for example, than, than Greeks actually did, especially Hellenistic, um, and the great Hellenistic uh, empires did, as a matter of fact. Roman libraries were visited, were frequented, were attended. Uh, the great Hellenistic libraries that contained the, the greatest treasures uh, of ancient wisdom and science were actually deserted. There was nobody there. There were just a very few um, courtly uh, scholars that essentially researched just with certain philological and encyclo uh, encyclopedistic uh, aims um, in, in this in enormous exterminated amount of knowledge that they couldn't cover individually, singularly, and there was effectively no systematic uh, use of that knowledge um, uh, as it's commonly thought, right? This idea that was even that the Roman conquest brought to a slowing down of technological development is, is partly true, telling the truth, definitely the, the conquest, the Roman conquest of the Hellenic polis did bring to, um, let's say, a relative um, slowing down or would not, you know, an effective end to certain uh, fields of research, etc. But we have to think of what it was effectively scientific research in, in, in the ancient world as well, and especially in that context. I mean, people who presume that, you know, there was uh, like a scientific, uh, we're taking place a scientific revolution in, in, in Hellenistic times before Roman um, conquest closed it and that mm, these people could invent, I don't know, the steam engine to make it work like with trains and steamboats, like they already had it and and nobody had the energies and the potential to put it to use in that way. So I'm not surprised this thing started in 17th or 18th century um, England uh, because 
there was a much different, uh, and a, a really, I mean, a very much different situation on that base. Uh, thinking about just all the components, uh, componentistic of, of of industry, the, the amount of capitals that were available through colonialism in modern Europe. I mean, it, it it's this delusion that the ancient world could have gotten, t you know, even to Mars. So this is an hyperbolism, of course, but that this this great progress was interrupted either by the Romans or by uh, the Dark Ages. Like this is, uh, we leave it to charlatans who have not even the, the the most basic notions of history of economics and of history of science and technology, and presume that the world actually gravitates around technology. Well, it's completely the other way around, right? Technologies alone have basically no value whatsoever. It's who uses them and in which contexts that makes the difference. Because technology alone is worthless, literally. And this is what every scientist knows. Um, but aside from this, this is my usual anti-technologistic and anti-modernistic um, kind of criticism that is coming probably be nauseating by a certain uh, uh, standard. But it, it's really important to understand also what were the actual ac accomplishments of Rome in this field and how actually open and receptive this culture was already at the time, right? Literacy was it was actually widespread in Rome since centuries at this point, right? The, the fact that by the third century, definitely Rome was still a rough and kind of... Um, a very um, bloody kind of military and uh, a warrior m mindset oriented um, civilization doesn't mean however that certain things w weren't already developed right it's just that they were relegated to certain um, dimensions of society that especially the elites that had always been ruling Rome and would always do um, even in, mo in its most republican moments let's say uh, let's say in this way, um, actually depreciated because Rome was effectively um, all about war, right? And th this this is an idea that must be also uh, eva uh, evaluated when realizing, in fact, that up to mid third uh, third century, essentially, and especially between the, the first and the second Punic Wars, uh, the uh, Roman the Roman world seems to open to something completely new or to something that up to that point had stayed out in some ways. Rome had had contacts for centuries with all the, you know, the, the uh, with Hellenic and Hellenistic powers uh, at that point. Um, and w uh, that world was pretty close. It was along the coasts of, uh, of southern Italy, uh, of Sicily. Greece, uh, Greece wasn't far away. Even Carthage, in, in many ways, was a Hellenized power. Look at its military culture by the time of the Punic Wars, for example. So Rome objectively does emerge from a kind of a backward um, background, in fact, uh, compared to these worlds, but also has this incredible capacity that no civilization uh, in the ancient world has ever um, showed in, in the same measure. Uh, by the same amount with of, of, of absorption and of ability of synthesis. And as we always say, the myth that the Romans basically stole things from others just to build their own civilization is also another, in fact, technologistic and uh, modernistic bias. Um, cultural appropriation as such uh, does not exist because there is not a single uh, human civilization who hasn't brought literally its entirety from previous achievements. Like, um, uh, a civilization can develop naturally its own and then there is a progress I I I along the way, but this is uh, something that emerges from the particular conditions of that specific civilization. Um, you can't, in next, let's say, you can't um, think to introduce um, a technology, an idea, uh, something that can bring according to your expectation, progress um, in a society, in a culture that is not able to to develop that because it's not arrived at its level of uh, of advancement. If th that requires working, right? Um, and therefore, when you look at civilizations that are 
uh, incredibly speedy and successful at integrating and putting to use someone else's uh, know-how. Um, and, and you you re you must know at that point that that civilization is already as advanced as that one, which doesn't mean that it has to do previously the uh, literally the same things that that situation does. It has to be identical to what that other civilization does, because no civilization and no culture is ever uh, uh, identical to another. But if that specific world weren't wasn't um, or it didn't have the tools and chiefly intellectual ones to to seize something put into use and even improve in it like the Romans actually did um, in many fields especially uh, engineering and military etc um, you you that thing wouldn't go on right and it wouldn't have an autonomous progress then it's um, this is particularly obvious because if you when you look at the Roman elites as such right uh, these people really started getting educated at levels that we also can't fully understand because it's not the Latin literature such is like the mirror of what literally uh, the world was at the time. We don't know a great deal uh, after all what that world was at the time. It is true that Rome always maintained a partly anti-intellectualistic uh, stances, let's say, against um, the, in fact, the Hellenistic um, philosophies and, and lifestyles also considered that Rome literally incorporated uh, countries like Greece and also some of the most flourishing thriving um, Hellenistic centers like Pergamon like uh, Antioch like uh, Rhodes Alexandria you know all over time of course not all the, the time we cover today but progressively so but even if it wasn't controlling directly those places militarily speaking it was still within the Mediterranean. Rome at this point is an imminently Mediterranean civilization. It, is, uh, it hasn't still began to expand in continental Europe and the Mediterranean is objectively at this point a Roman lake but essentially a Roman uh, yet Greek-speaking lake, right? So largely at least. Uh, naturally there are other many other cultures etc but evidently the achievements of the Greeks in, in culture, in um, in literacy, in literature, philosophy, etc., were definitely what also helped dramatically Rome to, to expand from the within and within the same world, right? Um, but this must be understood, however, with the capacity of the Romans to to really absorb the same culture of the conquered peoples that technically had even opened to Rome, right? The Greeks at one point had even in invited the Romans to participate to their Hellenicity, right? As recognizing them as as peers um, in, in a way uh, to participate at the Olympiad, things like this, um, because they recognized after all that they were um, uh, a civilization at that point and that, that surely owed a lot to the same Hellenistic one. This is this is obvious, but the realization that even can be found, I don't know, in Pyrrhus, since we like military stuff of, you know, there is this legion that Pyrrhus arrived close to Rome, look at, uh, at the uh, at the city or other, at the camps, because these are traditions and legions, and he said, you know, th these guys maybe are not so barbarian as they seem. There's something different. Look at their armies in March, looking at their camps, that allegedly, actually, they learned to build uh, tanks to the same Pyrrhus then, um, but it's obviously, you know, an approximation, uh, because, of course, they already had camps like other, even um, barbarians uh, had, f frankly. But the point here is that there was um, um, an astonishment, like from the side of many civilizations that encountered the Romans, that were coming actually from a, from an Hellenistic background, and looking at the Romans and saying, you know, these guys, expecting them to, bar to be barbarians, technically speaking, but finding out, after all, that they weren't. And actually, under underestimating the Romans and this is a great this was a great cultural problem that can explain uh, even psychologically in part while ev uh, eventually uh, the the rulers of the world the Hellenistic monarchs effectively lost to Rome in many ways it's not just all about structures and you know demographic potential military strength it's also about which also had in part they had naturally Rome had a unique system in terms of politics 
and um, and uh, its its civic participation that was completely unique and preceded. Um, and that's also another proof that the Romans were really uh, creating something different that the world had never seen. Um, and it, it, this is a deep historical problem and a realization, actually, because we, we don't know the Roman world at this beginning. Not that much, actually. not um, Almost not at all. Like, you have to think that literally, Roman hi true Roman history begins around the 70s of the 3rd century BC. Literally, but wha what happened before is not actual history, it's history mixed with myth. The Romans emerged from the mists of, of the myth, uh, from essentially that, that period. What we know about before is largely unknown. Uh, yet, from many hints, we realize that they were developing something on their own, and that even if they hadn't developed quite their literary traditions, that uh, in you know in a consistent way like the, the Greeks had done. However, they had developed something else, right? And the great myth, like as we'll see now, even I mean not the great myth, but the, the Romans uh, had a prejudice towards Hellenist, the Hellenistic world. The Romans were, uh, you know, Romans were it, they they make for an excellent <laughs> psychiatric uh, case. Like it, they're probably one of the most interesting peoples in their this point of view because. Um, they really had a very, very strained and contra you know controversial and tormented mindset relatively to what the the role of Rome had really to be um, in the world. They were sure that they would conquer the world. Like the Romans weren't wishing for conquering the world, like other peoples. Uh, they knew they would, which is a very different mindset. The Romans were emerging from a m radically military and, and, and essentially warlike mindset. So that's all what they were about. And l the idea in that regard is that Romans were warriors, conceptually. At this time, they weren't quite warriors anymore. They were more like soldiers. But the third century is here a great phase of transformation as well that had already mm, had its roots in, in the fort. But they were starting to be something else, really. Uh, at, um, uh, let's say, uh, many people overestimate, for example, the... Um, let's say, the, the Roman strengths before a certain time in history, you know, that we still live in the wake in the, in of the Legion of Rome, and the fact that the Romans were the same since the very beginning, and that they remained always that way, and that the only reason why they conquered the world was because they remained that way. No, if they had remained the way they were uh, at the beginning, they would have never gotten out of Latium, they would have never gotten out of Italy, they would have remained just another of the many Italic peoples that inhabited the, the Italian peninsula uh, and um, essentially not making a great deal of difference. The Romans do emerge radically and uh, in, in a way that actually mm, uh, um, they emerge in the third century mostly but what, what happens really that changed the thing at the roots was in the fourth century and th that's a very interesting phase we'll have to cover at one point today. I'm sorry I'm digressing about the history, <laughs> from history of literature in this regard, but, but I, I think it's very, very important to understand the background of this. Because if you study this just from a literary point of view, it's just a list of authors and saying, oh, well, okay, you know, the Romans met Greece and uh, they kind of copied this, their stuff and they became uh, kind of like them. Um, yeah, you can interpret that simplistically, but you have to look at what actually Rome continued to be in different terms, but also what, where they were coming from, because otherwise uh, it doesn't make sense even why they adopted Greek stuff after all um, in this field. But the point I was making is that the Romans were... Um, I, I, I don't even find a, a right adjective to, to define this, but of course they had enormous prejudices towards who was not from their of their kind, right? Which is strange and controversial to say because uh, we we know the Romans essentially for having uh, accept for having integrated, right? Uh, for having opened their citizenship, for having expanded, or at this time. Right, first with the Italic Saki, then eventually with other non-Italic populations uh, that were getting Romanized progressively. But there was a great cultural resistance at the beginning. Right, they were open, but not so open uh, from their own same perspective. Like compared to the Greeks, that would never share their citizenship to anyone because they were the Greeks' point. They were best ever dressed, sucked, uh, 
point, the Romans were absolutely not like that. They always had this this great awareness about the fact that they were coming from from a tribal context. They look at other tribal peoples, looking at as a part of their kind. But definitely, the Romans at this point had developed a, a political and cheerfully political uh, and cultural to identity that uh, at this point had also taken a sort of italic dimension, right? Having expanded. Um, through the, the peninsula, and, and, and mentally speaking, for many Romans, that were their boundaries. The Romans recognized that they were, as Latins, they were, they were Italics, that they sh did share with the Italics proper. Um, so this branch of the Indo-European peoples, not the, let's say, Italian peoples like the others, like the Etruscans, like uh, the, uh, you know, the, the guys, the Greeks from southern Italy, um, the, the Celts, uh, of, of northern central Italy and other populations that existed in the peninsula at the time, even Illyrian, uh, Illyrian origin, or even the Ligurians, we don't even know where they came from. Um, but, um, you know, th this idea that, that there was this bulk, this, this even geogra ev pretty evident geographical boundary that is the, the, the sea that, uh, you know, with the peninsula itself, um, that uh, was at this point hotly debated. Like, if you have studied the history of the Second Punic War, and you realize the the the, the enormous political, um, t you know, hostilities that existed at this point towards kind of the, the more traditional agrarian, we can say, um, latifundist, let's say better, um, party um, that essentially wanted to expand further in Italy towards the north and towards this kind of more. European dimension, those who wanted to open to the Hellenistic world, to trade, to traffics, to, in this sense, a new class that wasn't just the, the senatorial aristocratic one, but also, you know, the middle classes that at this time were expanding further, and they, they were still very, very strong, even though the Second Punic War itself would trigger a situation would essentially make, not, not the, the Roman middle, the Italic middle class die, but it's still, you know, being framed into a very different system from before, and and as you know, when when we talk about the the opening of Latin literature to to the to the Hellenistic world, we are talking essentially about the uh, the Second Punic War and the victory of Scipio and this Hellenistic um, vision. We can say that uh, at one point the Romans were obliged, even the, the most uh, let's say uh, traditionalist and conservative. Um, um, faction that they had to accept in, in many ways that the, the, the Second Punic War, Punic War devastated Roman society uh, by certain standards. At the point it was also a, um, a, a new the integration of other elements in, in the senatorial class, talking about the slaughter of Cannae uh, at the hands of Hannibal, and how th that seemingly affected even very much the political culture of Rome because there were new um, new citizens that came to power that fundamentally had a very diver different background from the old aristocracy. They were much more imprenditorial minded and, in a certain sense, and criticized in that regard, um, Romanly speaking, for, from a moral point of view. And um, the Romans, the, the Romans conceptually started from the idea that basically, if you were a literate, you were an effeminate, literally. I, I'm not kidding. Uh, I mean, the, the whole thing is that a true Roman conceptually had to be a warrior, a soldier, a commander, uh, respectful of go the gods, uh, of the old tradition, and of this mm, of these mores that uh, are very difficult to translate as old Latin terms, because, you know, we can't translate it like morals, but it's, it's never quite like we intend morals today. These are concepts that are at the base of our uh, linguistical civilization from Latin, but they they meant something very different from what we use um, today. And um, and this opening to the Hellenistic world in part was forced, uh, in part was naturally, uh, you know, there were components of the Roman world, uh, so certain sort of classes that ob asked for it, and uh, it was pretty convenient as well. But it was a cultural resistance in this regard, not much to the idea of, of this uh, essentially swallowing uh, every neighbor <laughs> that you know was around because Rome was literally like this uh, as always Rome was the next doors bully that always knocked uh, at your door and enters and seizes everything in a way or another uh, many of the d even donations I even think about Pergamon that 
the Italian last Italians donate to Rome like themselves so to, to help that, that was an extortion like all things the Romans just like any other people at the time would do that there was the the, the ancient world world knew just one logic and that was the one of conquest point there was no other uh, moral system at this point that basically challenged that view uh, which is even v interesting to mention at this point because as we will see there were certain philosophies that were pouring in Rome that, uh, that had from the east from from the Hellenistic tradition but really from that came from far away even from uh, from Central Asia and other um, and even beyond that um, the that had a great success in Rome and that were kind of forerunners in some ways even of certain principles that eventually Christianity um, you know spread uh, because Christianity came partly from from that in fact a Hellenistic cauldron as well right um, this is widely known and the um, the opening of Rome to to the east was um, the successful thing it's just that the romans at the beginning didn't quite know that so they especially the, the most conservative classes had their their reaction to this so today we will look from a literary point of view the two sides of the story right in observing how this transformation occurred and at the same time how this was received in domestically for, for by the romans and in the different classes so Basically, in the second half of the third century, we have the appearance of uh, in Rome of the first generation of properly Latin men of letters. That is, people who essentially made a living uh, in this way. The, the Romans had already their kind of their literary traditions, even their old traditions that were very important, very ancient. Um, so Latin literature didn't begin didn't begin here, but the you know the structured presence of of scholars and of uh, artists that produced a properly Latin literature means that they literally wrote in, in Latin, and that's essentially what it means. Begins at this point, right? Um, this this phase is dominated initially by Livius Andronicus. Mm -hmm. By the way, I will use classical pronunciation anyway. So if I pronounce like not in this case because there is not, but a hard vocal like C etc because that's what I'm following not the ecclesiastical one um, so Livius Andronicus was the first Roman poet about whom we have fragments right the name is naturally Livius is Roman but Andronicus is typically Greek like it's a Latinized version of Greek name um, and in fact he was brought to Rome from Taras, from uh, Taras in Greek, uh, Tarentum in uh, in Latin, Taranto in Italian today. So in essentially southern uh, Italy in a, a Greek city, right? So from a world that was not Roman, right? Was not just not just not Latin. Was also non, not even Italic proper, right? Uh, Taras definitely had had its share of contacts with the Italics, etc. But you know, it was still a Greek city, and it would remain a Greek city, in fact, at this point, under Roman control. Um, and this happened after the first Tarentine War in 272 BC. And Livius Andronicus was nonetheless the, the slave, in fact, of Livius Salinator, um, by whom he was eventually freed and preposed to the education of his children. It was typical, right? Uh, Ancient world, the slavery of all over, but not sl all slaves are equal. Most slaves would naturally be used in the most, um, you know, in, mo in the toughest, mo even most cruel um, ways uh, in the productive system uh, at the time. But the Hellenic slaves, right, were usually literate people. Um, and uh, especially there was someone naturally who was already a scholar, someone educated however was continued to be educated in this case um, and that therefore could be an educator for the same Roman aristocracy that at this point is evidently looking with favor even at having their children actually educated by by Greeks right so by people by the people at the time was the most educated over so th the Romans already realized that this form of education was important naturally it was at the beginning mediated uh, in many ways, 
So about Livius Andronicus we have a few fragments from his Odyssea, which is nonetheless that the Latin version in uh, Saturnian verses of the uh, of Homer's Odyssey, right? It was uh, read in fact in the schools in the Roman schools up to the first century BC. Mm, so it had a great success. This translation. Think of what it means, right? To be able even to translate. Uh, today we don't have the time to actually focus distinctively on these uh, authors, but one may m m we may expand on Latin literature, which is dramatically interesting. It was possibly my most favorite uh, subject in, s in high school, at least, and because it, it really dis opens to your world that uh, you can't see if just deal like we're doing today with just one historical uh, point, but just think of what it means to translate the Odyssey, so together with the Iliad, the, the single most important uh, work in um, in the Atlantic tradition in in Latin, right? It's not a uh, it's not so easy, right? Not all the words. In fact, telling the truth, that's that's what partly we have been doing still today because there were translations from from Latin, right? Just from Greek in uh, in European tradition eventually of these terms, and uh, we have a great difficulty even to understand works like the, uh, the Iliad or the Odyssey. Because sometimes we we linguistically lose track of what could be in the Atlantic uh, Middle Ages the the, the idea of, uh, of of the and the meaning of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Right? We have transformed these works in sort of uh, uh, kind of neoclassical works today, but they they came from a world that was dramatically close to Indo-European warrior culture that we have completely erased or almost from our past. Because of this rationalization and, in fact, uh, modernization of of La uh, Hellenic uh, and Latin literature, that we operated chiefly mm, af chiefly after the French Revolution has made massive cultural damage. It's also done positive things, of course, but um, including this idea that um, these worlds were fundamentally sterilized by the, the the pure aesthetics and uh, conceptualism and idealism of later. Uh, improperly Hellenistic philosophies. Why they were these were fundamentally tribal uh, contexts. That were beginning to to look at more deeply at this spirituality of their own, producing these works. Um, but it's very important that the Romans begin to study this on on their own. Um, in 240 BC, according to at least the most probable um, date, uh, Livius Andronicus gave his first dramatic representation, um, adapting in Latin language, in the so-called Diverbia and Cantica, the Hellenic uh, metrics, and we have certain fragments and titles of eight or maybe nine tragedies, Achilles, um, let's, let's read it in, per, per in the classical pronunciation, Aegisthus, Ajax Mastigophorus, Andromeda, Danae, Equus Trojanus, Hermione, Ino, and Tereus. And then three Palliatai comedies, um, the Gladiolus, um, hence the, the small sword, Ludius, the Histrion, let's say, the Verpus, the circumcised, and modeled on the new comedy of uh, Menander and Philemon. Right, so it's the all, all Hellenic models here. And um, Andronicus was also an actor in, in his own dramas. He, um, in 207 BC, after um, you know, kind of scary things that had happened in Rome, Andronicus um, composed by order or of the Pontificus in honor of uh, Juno Regina, uh, Juno Queen, uh, a Carmen that was sung in a by, by a uh, choir of uh, 27 virgins, and after the happy uh, outcome of this propitiatory uh, song, the Senate instituted in honor of Livius Andronicus in the temple of Minerva on the Aventine, the college of the writers and the actors. This is very important because the collegium, um, singular collegium in Rome, were essentially these uh, corporations of, uh, in this case of yeah, of, of crafts, of professions, that that effectively had their own 
space in the city, even economically speaking, as you can imagine, were associated also to they, they had a tutelar uh, deity, right? Uh, like uh, this is not a medieval invention. <laughs> it was had always been like that since ever civilization existed. That was a protector, uh, god or later saint for the uh, special uh, for the the craft, etc. And, and and these collegia had their they were located literally in the temples themselves. Naturally, there were many uh, of them. Um, then, um, in the years between 215 and 160 BC, there was the second generation, right, after one of Livius Andronicus, that triumphed uh, with Nevius, right, um, and the second national epopee of Rome that is dedicated uh, to the story of the war against Carthage, that was the most important uh, ideal in history of, of, of Roman you know, memory, national memory, we can say. So Nevius, as, as, as it was called actually Cnaeus Naius, uh, was this dramatic uh, figure in Latin poetry. He died, we don't know when he was born, he died in Attica, um, in um, North Africa, uh, towards 201 BC. Um, and he was originally from Campania, Right, so the region uh, just south of Rome dramatically advanced and also deeply Hellenized since ancient times. Um, and he was a veteran of the First Punic War. He was author of uh, about 30 Pagliatai. Hmm? Uh, he wrote about satire, um, chiefly in the ways of the ancient Attic comedy. Um, and he criticized Quintus Cecilius Metellus and Scipio Africanus Maior. So, some of for for this reason, you don't touch these people at the time. They're fine. Uh, you know, forgive me, the, but they're essentially the, the heroes of Rome. And so, for for this reason, he actually was imprisoned, and hence he was uh, exiled in um, North Africa. And he wrote tragedies among which uh, Romulus and Clastidium that are the first examples of uh, praetextae um, I I literally gender and in uh, the uh, and also and most importantly actually the oldest Roman national poem the bellum poenicum right so the actually the, the Phoenician war the, the the Punic war and and in, in Saturnian uh, verses uh, about the first Punic War to which he had participated um, and in which he reconnected the origins of Rome to the legend of Aeneas right so from a part of the scholars it's admitted this possibility that Nevius preceded Virgil in imagining the stop of um, Aeneas in Carthage and this sad, uh, this unfortunate love between him and uh, Dido, um, the queen of Carthage, uh, to whom Nevius seems to make a reference in the poem. And um, there is, in fact, this debated fragment um, that is by some uh, attributed, in fact, to, to a dialogue between Dido and Aeneas, even if we don't uh, have the full text, so we can't really no cent for cent. Um, at the same time, there are differing opinions relatively to the position of the Trojan legion in the poem itself, whether it was at the beginning or later, or it was kind of a digression inserted. Um, but for this uh, this genial uh, fusion, let's say, between myth and historical reality, and also for this kind of primitive vigor of the artistical expression. Nevius' poem was admired by the ancient and was also an example for Ennius and Virgil, right? And uh, as as we've said, there are just however few fragments uh, remaining today. Um, Nevius was also author of comedies, um, in which he surely drew from uh, Hellenic exemplars in his canon of the uh, Roman comical poets, uh, Volcacius uh, Serigitus, uh, 
uh, assigned to him the third place after Cuculius and Plautus. It's in this period that Latin historiography proper is born, literally speaking, with Fabius Pictor. Hmm? So he was the, in fact, the most ancient Roman analyst. He took part to the Gallic War of 225 BC um, after the Battle of Cannae. Already senator, he actually took part to an embassade sent to Delphi to interrogate the famous oracle. It's happened in 216 BC. Um, uh, Fabius Pictor's work comprehended all the history of Rome from the origins till to his times, at least until 217 BC. Um, about the origins is interesting the version of the Trojan Legion that actually would remain the, the traditional one. For the Sinaitic Wars, um, there was a, he probably drew from a fam familial tradition of his, of his um, gens. And um, about the Second Punic War, he, you know, he simply was a first-hand witness, so he knew uh, fairly enough what, what was going on. Um, and the work, interestingly enough, was written in Greek, right? Uh, but, uh, in fact, it seems it was translated in Latin just later on. And probably was conceived in this sense as a propaganda work uh, in favor of Rome among the Greeks at the same time. This was very important. The Romans were opening to the Greeks in many ways, uh, in this sense opening to uh, even th the same means through which normally uh, the Atlantic political and, and social and economical uh, st system wa was, was about, think about even you know, the opening of Rome to mi minting coins displayed on them, as Rome was coming from a different background, it was mostly an agrarian, italic power, the, the Greeks were chiefly a maritime power in their own regard. So there was a, a new language that was needed to bridge essentially the the gaps and the the uncertainties, the distrust that naturally the, the, the Hellenic communities felt towards Rome since they had been conquered by it largely from from less than one century, right? Or even more recently. So uh, this was very important. And Fabius Pictor's history of Rome was even used largely by Polybius, that we will see later, but that we have met quite often uh, in our military uh, history videos about the Hellenistic times and the uh, Roman army. Um, so Fabius Pictor, another very, very important figure. Then uh, we can't avoid to talk, of course, about the Comedies of Plautus that um, in this regard accentuated the Italic and Roman character of, of theater. And this is very important because the Romans had already a tradition on their own in this regard, a representative uh, of you know, uh, shows, of plays, um, and uh, actually an ancient tradition. Uh, Plautus himself was a very fascinating figure, oh, almost mythical. He was born, according to tradition, in Sarsina, in basically in central, close to, actually to northern Italy. In fact, he was said to have been red-haired, and maybe he was of even a Celtic origin, um, around 250 BC. And he died maybe in Rome in, in 184 BC. And uh, tradition wants that his cognomen, so was... Uh, originally speaking, was Plotus, so that his, essentially his nickname, right, um, uh, was this one. It was eventually urbanized in Plautus. And uh, the pronomen and the nomen actually are unknown, are uncertain at least. Uh, probably he, he his full name was Titus Machius Plotus or Plautus, um, but uh, the old tradition also speaks of an M. Dot Accus, hmm? so hence we don't understand because both Machius and Accus were two Latin names, um, and according to some, uh, his nickname was even Maccus, um, hence uh, which was derived uh, as a nickname from the uh, homonymous mask of the Farsa Atellana. It was this uh, other play uh, type, and about Plautus' life, we know a few. And in a sort of 
romance-like way. Uh, it seems that he was first helper in a company of comedians and that uh, eventually he fell in extreme poverty and he began to work at the mill, um, at, like literally pushing the, the stone for, 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 you know, mashing the olives and uh, grain, etc. And uh, it's allegedly here, <laughs> we don't clearly know how, but it's probably, it's possible in theory, uh, that he began to compose comedies that eventually met with the favor of the public, that in, in this sense didn't aban uh, abandon him anymore. And Plautus composed a really a lot of comedies. And uh, shortly after his death, um, he was so famous that there were also a lot of falsifications that circulated um, under his name um, up, up to at least 130 BC. So you know, after up to 50 years after his death, and this tells you how you know massive his success had been. And Plautus comedies, I don't know if you ever attended, but they're extrem extremely funny. Um, they're they're amazing um, and hilarious. And maybe one day we will talk about them more in detail. Um, and the, however, relatively to this attribution problem, the Latin philology, um, the 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 rising Latin philology, let's say, began to mm, essentially scope this critically this. Plautus work and uh, his attribution uh, and this tradition culminated with the systematization by Varro that uh, was a scholar of Elius Stilo that had already been a, a Plautian uh, critic uh, we can say and Varro essentially distinguished Plautus comedies in three groups uh, 90 that were surely um, spurious uh, 19 of dubious authenticity, while 21 surely by Plautus himself. And in fact, it's just these last ones that continue to be read and um, transcribed, and that in fact arrived to us. And this is amazing. And the manuscripts um, really handed them over uh, to to us in a um, in, a pro in an approximately alphabetic order. And these are, or in Latin of course, Amphitruo, Asinaria, Aulularia, Captivi, Curculio, Casina, Cistellaria, Epidicus, Bacchides, Mostellaria, Menaicmi, Miles Gloriosus, Mercator, Pseudolus, Penulus, uh, po po um, Poinulus, um, Persa, Rudens, Sticus, Trinumus, Truculentus, and Vidularia. And the last comedy is uh, preserved just in fragmentary form. The Amphitruo, the Cistellaria, and the, the Aulularia are lacunos. The Bacchides is missing the beginning. Um, uncertain is the chronology of the comedies, of which only Stichus and uh, Pseudolus are dated with certainty respectively to 200 and 191 BC. Plautus' comedies are composed according to the model of the new Attic comedy by Menanders, Philemon and Diphilus, uh, sometimes um, with the method of contamination, and Menanders was relatively scarcely imitated. Um, in fact, um, in the inspiration to this, there is some kind of non-congenial thing of um, to to the Latin poet that doesn't didn't feel attracted by the by Menander's um, complex uh, and sc um, scarcely comic sensitivity. Um, the formal originality of Plautus towards the, the Hellenic model model consists um, especially in the abolition, total abolition of of the choir. Um, Already in the actic comedy, the choir had been reduced to a minimum, right? Uh, except for the exception of the um, uh, choral I interludium in the Rudens, and the abolition of which, however, uh, Plotus makes it correspond to uh, you know quite extended use 
uh, in place of the traditional metrics of recitation, the jambic trimeters and the trochaic tetrameters. Um, of meters of all varieties, including the originally lyrical meters. In metrics, Plautus is a master. He uh, models following the necessities of Latin language, the already uh, known uh, jambic sceneries and the so-called quadrati verses in a ver variety of forms that are also, you know, by the way, bent to very subtle rules. Um, it's exactly from the study of Plautian metrics that uh, have been born the modern researchers of anci uh, ancient metrics, including the Atlantic one. And the mix of the meters is precise in the two forms of the the verbium uh, and the uh, and the one of the canticum that we have already met before. Uh, th these were respectively the uh, recited parts without accompaniment and the uh, r r let's say uncompained recitative part um, that were alternated in Plautus' work with extreme freedom. And there is this prevalent opinion that Plautus, such as his uh, predecessor Nevius, had uh, drawn this variety from the Etruscan. Uh, the musical Etruscan uh, comical theater, right? It was already spread in, in the Latin world. Was the Etruscan culture was very prominent in Rome, as we all know. Um, and this in turn had to be formed in part on mm, Hellenic metric and, and metrics and music, right? And for Plautus, more, um, I mean, as and more uh, than he is um, the other Latin orders. Uh, we have mm, wondered um, about the originality compared to, to the Hellenic models proper, right? From from this point of view, Plautus is one of the most studied um, ancient writers. The Plautian critics that presents many difficulties and problems, in fact, has been one of the most um, one of the richest in uh, discoveries and results, right? But the true originality of Plautus cannot be fully understood um, if not he, if in, in kind of overwhelming temperament in his uh, f fantasies and varied uh, comicity in that even in this mm, acceptance of the um, kind of older modules of popular of the popular farce right that are n that were necessary at that point to obtain the consensus of the Roman public that was not very a very refined one right it also preserved however an inextinguishable vitality and this is probably one of the greatness even of of certain traditions that are apparently kind of more primitive that you know that poses more challenges artistically speaking because they're they're less complex and therefore you have to to invent every time something new with theoretically less or at least with a public that you know it's going to accept just a part of, of your repertory of your of your instruments let's say so for example if the characters are not al always um, characterized with a subtle art the dialogue for example is always very effective um, even the language is exceptionally rich. Uh, Lat uh, mm, let's say Plotus Latin is the most lively Latin. I it's very popular in character. That's also very important. But at the same time, it's always very, you know, circumstantiated and built always I in order to obtain a specific effect. Plotus uh, mm, remodeled the new comedy with the spirit of the italic farce and that, um, let's say he he didn't care much about the novelty for example of the inter you know the intertwinement um, in, in the plot but he always knew how to provide certain um, um, let's say a new uh, an ever new life to relatively arid and mechanic uh, schemes right um, in fact, thanks to this extraordinary expressive force of the dialogue proper. If you, if you look, if you attend one of Plautus' comedy, you understand what you're doing. It's very, 
very fast. In, in some ways, it's very, it's very alive. It's very characterized. The characters are always full of this, um, of this personality that emerges quite boldly. And, and, and you can see from it the, the effective the plebeian world, an exuberant, robust uh, plebeian world, um, of um, of which Plotus is is kind of an in, in, inexhaustible narrator, right? Um, there is to say also that in the Middle Ages, Plautus' comedy was scarcely known, right? His, uh, his fortune actually is dated back to the Renaissance, when together with um, uh, Terentius' work, uh, this uh, Plautus' one determined the birth of even of modern comedy itself. So there's a huge legacy, as we all know, from Plautus' uh, work, right? Um, and then there is Ennius, right? He belonged to the same generation, right? Of the second, uh, say, to this is second generation of Latin writers. Um, he wrote essentially for the glory of Rome, the Annales, this story, very long history o of the city, in thirty thousand verses. Ennius is also another Quintus Ennius, another dramatic, important figure. Um, the Annales are uh, eighteen books long, right? Thirty thousand verses, as we have seen. Very consistent work. Beautiful read, by the way. Um, Ennius was born in Rudia. Um, close to Taras, himself to you, um, he was said to have this, um, in fact, this kind of mixed um, cultural background that helped him to understand a, a lot the different different cultures at the same time. Um, he was born in 239 BC and he died in Rome in 169 BC. And um, uh, his annales are in chronological order. And they uh, start for, from the uh, happenings of the history of Rome and of Latium, starting from the arrival of Aeneas. So you see here the Aeneid uh, tradition, how it, 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 it was alive since this point. And th there's all the problem where this ca came from, how much, you know, since when the Romans were aware of this. We don't know exactly because of this kind of late arrival of the Romans to this uh, consistent literary tradition. But it was recognized already at this point. But so all of these others at once. So these were legions that were, were around there for, for quite a, a time. And then we we know just the Virgil one usually. But you know th there were literally a lot of different versions of this story, much of which are actually lost, unfortunately. Um, the great novelty brought by Ennius is the substitution of the heroic examiner that was the verse of Hellenic. Uh, Epist to the Saturnius, and with this he effectively posed the foundation of Latin poetry, right? And even if the Indian examiner is still uh, kind of hard and rough, and if the research for the effect brought the poet to use a kind of distasteful um, uh, assonances, al alliterations for the later uh, refined standards of later uh, times and say, um, and you s still opened uh, the path to the uh, to uh, the Augustian poetry telling the truth. So it was dramatically important. Um, we know that Ennius served in Sardinia in 204 BC where Cato brought um, him, s uh, him with, with himself in Rome where he even Began, uh, became friend with Scipio Africanus and Scipio Nasica, right? So here, these are very high circles, as you understand. Eventually, in 189 BC, um, following Marcus Fulvius Nobilior in the expedition in Aetolia, he uh, to to the mm, to the sack the, the the capture of Ambracia mm, in 184 BC, he was with. Um, the um, with Quintus, that was Fulvius' son, uh, to the deduction of a colony in the Picanum in central Italy, where uh, Ennius uh, had a, uh, a plot of land from Quintus, and as a consequence, he obtained Roman citizenship. Right. In fact, he he wrote Nos sumus Romani, 
qui fuimus ante Rudini, right? So he, you know, now we we are the Romans, while before we were we came, we came from Rudi, which he stated with, with joy later on in one of, of the last books of his Annales, right? Did, did think about here these provincials becoming effectively Roman citizens and participating in this sense to, you know, with their cultural background to the development of the same Roman literature. Very important. And in spite of these favors, however, Ennius lived uh, relatively poorly um, in a house on the Aventine together with Cecilius Statius, working up to the last of his days. Um, and um, he had his last tragedy represented, the Tiestus, in fact, the same year of his death. And Ennius had a fortune among the you know, later generations that recognized in him the father of Latin poetry as well. Um, and he was often quoted by Cicero, eventually was imitated by Virgil, and remembered by Horace, Ovid, Propertius, Quintilianus, um, Marshall, um, and uh, although with varying mm, judgments, let's say, Eventually, his fame was obscured. He had he had began his literary activity with the tragedies, but that he also took from, as we've seen from in in his model in their models from from Greece. Um, in this being facilitated by his own origin, right? And he spoke Oscan and Greek at the same time. So he actually was one of the he was Italic properly. He wasn't Greek, uh, but at least he knew. Um, and he, that there is this legend. He he obviously learned Latin, um, and in fact there is the famous phrase by Gallus that uh, Ennius was proud and boasted his tria corda, which in Latin means the three hearts, right? Saying that these three souls, these three um, cultural backgrounds that he had had helped him a lot to, to actually to dialogue with all three. This is very, very important. Ennius is beautiful read in this regard because, I mean, this, I must say, the impression that these works make uh, when you read them are always the ones of a very, um, a very full literature. This is not empty. This is not just for appeasing someone. It's really about expressing certain cultural values. And it's a real pleasure to read. Um, and we have from Ennius remaining um, over 19 works. Um, we have several fragments from tragedies that were essentially imitated from Eur Euripides and from the Trojan cycle, mostly. They had a lot of success at the time, still in 45 BC. Uh, the Androma Andromacha Aikma uh, Lotus, which means the Andromacha prisoner of war, was still represented. So think about the fame over, over t the centuries. Um, we also have an, uh, uh, the title of a pretexta de Sabinae, uh, based on the legion of raped the Sabines, and of an Ambracia, that is the exaltation, the dramatized exaltation of the enterprise of Marcus Fulbus Nobilier, um, that as we've seen was, you know, where the same Ennius, to which the same Ennius had participated. This was already retained a pretexta, and um uh, by by others instead um was however considered by as a celebrative carmen like the scipio that he wrote by you know praising the africanus and he also wrote two um palliatai comedies uh, the caupuncula or tabernaria and the pancratiastes uh, about which we have only a few some fragments essentially and we have a few actually from other lesser works of these. We have the Saturai in, in more books. Um, the, there is a sixth one which is quoted as such. And on various topics, um, Ennius was kind of polymetric uh, in this work. According to, to him, there was, uh, like according to some at least, there was this alternation of prose and verses, such as the Satura Menipea, for example, uh, that was present also in the Scipio. And similar to them, for the moralistic character, had to be also the Potre uh, Protrepticus. It was a book of precepts in tetrameters um, on the Trochaic model and the Sota. 
um, from Nome of Sotides, the Hellenic uh, poet of the 3rd century BC. It was author of um, a particular type of satira, it was known as the uh, Synodologia, of which Ennius adapted the meters, the tone, the topics, and the kind of the uh, unprejudiced form, um, even up to you know, reaching the scurrility, uh, if you want. Uh, we also have certain culinary recipes, um, perhaps in examiners, and um, this is the po little poem ed Edifa Getica, or ed Edifa Getica, if you prefer. While it was in trochaic tetrameters, the Epicharmus was the real aberration of a small poem um, on nature attributed f falsely at that point to Epicharmus. Then there was the Eumerus or Sacra Historia, it was a real aberration perhaps of a work by Evemerus. It was about the famous theory of the human origin of, of gods. Um, but the major work of Ennius, for which he was considered the um, Roman national poet up to Virgil, is in fact the historiographical work of the, uh, the Annales, this poem of 18 books um, that took him most of his life to write. Uh, and Ennius perhaps published the poem in different moments, and the first three books had to deal with the royal, the time, the monarchic period, the books from four to six of the events up to the Punic Wars that were told instead in this uh, from the seventh to the ninth book. Uh, from the tenth to twelfth book, the Macedonian War was uh, this uh, was you know told, and in the th from the thirteenth to the sixteenth book, also the war with Antiochus the third up to the uh, Istrian War in one hundred seventy eight B.C. and about were the books 17 and 18 it's not possible to reconstruct essentially what the, the, the contents um, and you essentially drew this concept in part the design of the bellum poinicum by Nevius adapting the content to the mm, the lineages let's say of the Homeric epos essentially mitigating the fantastic element in it the uh, direct intervention of the divinity with the exaltation of Roman virtue, right? So basically, not saying this is about the gods changing the story, but really about uh, the Roman virtue. It was essentially the same thing because at the end of the day, um, the Roman virtue was literally, you know, gods really operating through the the chosen one, uh, the Roman with his values, his morals, etc. So this is very important. Because it's a new and a different way to to decline essentially the even the moral of of a story and it's largely in fact religious meaning in fact concentrating on romanity as such of the eighteen books that are roughly thirty thousand verses long we have about six hundred verses uh, unfortunately um, if which are fragments in, in part, um, or sometimes we have single verses um, or uh, certain detached words uh, sometimes that give us just a pale idea of what the poem was, but from it we can actually spot the enthusiasm with which certain great Roman characters are depicted in their virtues and we can um, observe uh, accents of high um, level of poetry that are united to a vivid sense of beauty of nature as well, which is poetic and very, very fascinating. Um, so Ennius is dramatically important because he marked the transition um, with the mm, the generation of 160 BC, right? It was animated by the so-called circle of the Scipiones, uh, were figures of first hand like Polybius, Terentius, or Terence if you prefer, Lelius, uh, known as the Wise, and Pacuvius, also uh, the first tragic poet, eventually Accius, maybe the greatest of the tragic uh, Roman tragics, and, and eventually Lucilius, of a series of s uh, satires and creator of the Latin classical satire uh, gathered. So 
And these figures are very, very important, right? You know that the, the Scipiones were essentially the uh, this branch of the uh, Gens Cornelia that uh, appears for the first time in f 4th century BC, and it was eminently famous, especially during the 3rd and 2nd century BC, and eventually essentially decayed at the end of the Republic, um, it went extinguished, um, seemingly completely, and many characters of these families were chiefly great generals, which just like Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. Yes, the greatest of all Roman generals by any, you know, without any doubt. Um, that, that as we were saying before, were, were essentially those from the sign of, th that opened to Hellenization, right? So, uh, it's very important that it's around this Roman aristocratic family that these um, new revival in taste in, in literature um, began, right, in, in Roman society. Uh, um, the the Scipiones essentially in foreign policy were thinking of this um, enlightened imperialism of Rome uh, extending over the Hellenistic world as such and for for this reason, they were adverse to the traditionalists. So even the appearance of this of these authors actually means a lot, even with this um, with, with this character. Right, this was dramatically important for our knowledge of Rome itself, right? Um, as we will see with Polybius now, especially, um, and it's uh, for this reason that Roman culture at this point began to to absorb a lot from from Greece. Um, um, in terms of influences, etc., and naturally, I don't think at this point we have to talk about Polybius because Polybius is this enormous figure, and he is uh, is part of Hellenic literature, not of Latin literature. He wrote in Greek, but is this dramatic source for our understanding of third century Rome? We, without Polybius, we basically wouldn't know much. We would know. A very few about the Punic Wars, the expansion. I mean, from from an actual modern point of view, Polybius is. Uh, it's like if you read him, you know it. It's it's like talking to a uh, reading from a person that that lives today. Um, that's the modernity of the Greeks. That's the, the really critical um, modern, um, uh, kind of even positivistic mindset. Like Polybius, in this sense, when you read him, when especially in military matters never kind of fully trust what he says because he, he is, he's a rationalist and he's kind of making s uh, he's trying to make sense of a lot of things without uh, in a way that was typically um, Hellenic in this regard which was to 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 be happy for having made sense of something but not necessarily of having actually <laughs> you know tested whether that is correct that it's real right but it's this Polybius is immense. It's utterly. Uh, it's one of my favorite authors in general, and um, we don't talk about him today. But if it hadn't been for him, we would know dramatically few about the Roman army, the Polybian army. In fact, it took it the name from from the fact, you know, normally Rome, you know, we talk about the Roman armies and their evolution through the the name of the reformers, <laughs> and the, the Polybian army takes takes the name after the men of letters. That wrote about them, right? He wasn't. He wasn't just a man of letters, right? He was. Uh, he was an aristocrat himself, essentially. But um, uh, it's 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 him. Like, if you want to study the the phase of Roman military in warfare, you that's the the forced um, the forced figure. Um, this other author that we mentioned is very important, Marcus Pacubius. Hmm? Uh, Latin poet was born in Brundisium, so once again in s uh, southeastern Italy, in a highly Hellenized area, um, in two hundred twenty BC. And he died, in fact, in Taras, Tarentum, at the time, uh, Latinized, uh, in the, from the Roman perspective, at least in one hundred thirty BC, circa. And uh, and he he's one, as we were saying before, he was one of the greatest tra geographers of. Of the time, Latin literature, uh, in his production, he um, basically sets certain trends uh, in terms of dramatic color of the action and this kind of s sentential, um, st stimulating s sententiosity. I don't even know how to say that. The dots, the, the work is, is present all 
Latin tragedy up to Seneca, essentially. And with Pacuvius begin this macabre uh, appearances of the of the dead, which was a topic, you know, even in the Atlantic historiography. So this contact with the after, you know, with the with the afterlife, with the world of the dead, um, and uh, it's um, th this gives a kind of a darkness, kind of a darkness to it. This, um, and but from from a technical point of view. There is a um, process of major discipline of the principal meter of the dialogues. That is the jambic sen uh, scenarios, as we've seen before. Also, it was present, but it's, this kind of gets better uh, employed. It's kind of pathetic, um, sensitive, and almost baroque expression of the uh, feelings and of of the contexts of the backgrounds that frame the spread um, and. Pacovius was the last mean, let's say, of, of Latin theater to work on, actually on the crowds, right? This is important. Eventually, a Roman society would change and these works would, in fact, remain at kind of a higher level. So we have this still this connection between the author and the, the popular level, which is very important. And about his life, um, Pacovius was actually Ennius' nephew. Right, this is very important. He um, he went with his uncle in in Rome, where he exercised in uh, in painting. Hence the and um, and he uh, he also wrote tragedies. In fact, and he was friend and host to Lelius. He attended the circle of Scipio Aemilianus as well. Um, when he was 80, still he had um, one of his tragedies represented, but eventually he retired to Tarentum, when he, where he, as we have seen, he would end his days. Um, about him, we have essentially 12 safe titles of tragedies, and in 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 total around 300 fragments. That for for a total. Of a bit more 400 verses so naturally these works are all kind of they're very ancient let's be honest and the context also is very kind of archaic in part and um, four tragedies derive from Sophocles especially the crisis their Myona, Niptra and Teucer uh, even you understand from the titles these are all kind of uh, or, uh, you know topics that teams that were written in fact by and Aeschylus, the Armorum Eudicium, um, and one from Euripides, the Antiope. Antiope. And um, in general, Pacovius mm, uh, resents mm, Euripides' influence as demonstrate the six tragedies of Hellenic uh, topic, especially the uh, Hellenic theme, like the Medus, Atalanta, Iliona, Periboia. Dolorestes and Pentheus, that are all very, um, you know, variedly derived from the famous dramas of Euripides, and uh, there is this dubious attribution to Pac uh, to Pacovius of a pro uh, Protesilaus and of some other tragedy, about which we we know essentially just the title, and we know also very few about the poetical te uh, poetical and dramatic technique of Pacovius and it seems that he composed uh, also music together with his dramas which uh, according to Cicero in fact um, caused a great impress impression on the spectators um, especially the music of the Canticum of the Shadow of Diphilus in the Iliona and Pacovius composed also a praetexta uh, named Paulus in honor of Lucius Aemilius Paulus, winner over famous of Perseus uh, of Macedon at Battle of Pydna in 168 BC, and it seems that he also wrote some satires, satires, right, as such, uh, in Ennius style. But um, even if Pacuvius was very able in this variety of meters, seemingly he also had a pretty harsh style. Um, and um, yet his tragedies kept following, you know, having a great fortune. They were appreciated in the Latinity, broadly meant. Uh, 
and they produce a great effect, especially for their pathos and for the strength of force of expression, the complexity um, of the plot, you know. And it, of Pacovius, we know also, uh, in fact, a, a, a painting activity, as we recalled, Plinius the Elder uh, records, in fact, that his paintings at the Temple of uh, Hercules at the Forum Boarium, uh, famously close to, to, to the t Tiber, um, that um, that because the temple had been restored, in fact, by Aemilius Paulus after the victory of Pydna, right? So he was, Pacuvius was involved also in this, um, on the local decorations in this, in the painting decorations in this regard. So mm, then, talking about Accius that we mentioned before, Lucius Accius. Uh, in Ecclesiastes, it would be Lucius Accius. Um, he was born in Pisaurum, 170 BC, so he was from actually um, central Italy, almost to almost in, in Cisalpine Gaul, basically on the Adriatic coast. Um, and he died around 84 BC. So he seemingly had, uh, Accius had a servile origin. And um, yet he had this uh, fame and fortune during his long life, as we understand here. Like you don't arrive, uh, you know, to essentially 86 years old so easily between the second and the first century BC. Uh, Accus was a poet. Um, he had a great imagination, a great talent, especially in tragedies. We have 45 titles with. Um, for a total of 700 frag short fragments. Um, in some of them he imitated Sophocles and Euripides, uh, but with a Roman topic of the praetexti um, that uh, he made instead were the Brutus that referred to the, you know, the expulsion of Rome of Tarquinius the Super. Then the Decius so I uh, ne die that dealt with the sacrifice of Publius Decius Mus. Uh, albeit we don't know which of the three, you know, that uh, Publius Decius Mus is the name of three Roman generals <laughs> basically um, called for the devotio in battle, so they basically sacrificed themselves um, as dead men before the battle in ex uh, to the deity of war in exchange for, for victory, right? And actually, one didn't die, <laughs> so it was a problem that it was all a right that had to be carried out to, to, to fulfill the, the vote because that was literally um, a duty at that point. Um, Accus has a s kind of a high and even kind of vocal style. He introduced basically in Latin tragic theater this character of kind of turgid and maybe even redundant theatrality. He wrote uh, also the Annales in Examiners that was a work basically on the uh, on the fe uh, festivals of the year, right? Um, a little work um, in a Sotoden meter it was perhaps part of the Didascalica. There, w there were a sort of um, uh, a type of the Satura in, in at least nine books. Um, he also wrote the Pragmatic uh, in Trochaic Septenaries, at least three, uh, excuse me, two books, and on um, the themed on theater and dramatic poetry. He also cultivated the Georgic poetry with the Praxitica or Parerga, they were called uh, in Senaries, right? Our very important figure we mentioned before is Lucilius, Gaius Lucilius. Uh, he was a satiric poet of the second century BC. He belonged uh, to the uh, circles of the Scipiones, as we have recalled, and he actively participated in the cultural life of of the time, and also the one of the uh, the, the years of the Gracchi. And he wrote thirty books of satires, about which we have only thirteen hundred verses. I mean, only it's a lot actually, but uh, it's fragmentary, and this brings to the um, 
essentially to the maturation of the definitive s formal systematization of this kind of poetic mm, uh, work um, at, at the time in Latin literature. And he was born in Sessa Aurunca, maybe in 180 BC. Uh, St. Jerome says that he was born in 148. Um, maybe because he got confused with the um, with the cons uh, with the name of the consuls that uh, were homonymous. In fact, um, Lucilius fought in the Numantine War between 134 and 133. Um, B.C. was being poured in war in, in Spain against the Celtiberians, um, and um, he m he lived fairly well, you know, affluent in, in Rome, um, except for a short period in which he was um, sent. He was hit by a law that essentially prescribed the um, the removal, like the expulsion, of the non-Roman citizen. Right, so these were all provincials. This is important to to bear in mind. Right, this law was enforced between 126 and 124 BC. Complicated period. We will have to cover it at one point. And um, belonging to the circle of the Scipiones, he got uh, intimate friend with Scipio Emili Aemilianus himself, and also of Lelius, um, also of the analyst Aulus Postumius Albinus, of the the grammarian. Elius still, and he participated personally and contributed to the formation of the cultural flourishing of uh, this phase. Um, he died um, perhaps in 114 BC. Um, um, he he wrote <coughs> Lucilius wrote 30 books of satires, about which we have this 1300 verses we said before. Um, this poetic mm, genre was cultivated in Rome since Ennius and Pacuvius, as we have seen. It was brought by Lucilius to this full maturation and definitive formal systematization. Um, and this is uh, the one of uh, a composition of examiners, examiners uh, um, by characterized by a simple and discursive language. Sometimes by even uh, an aggressive tone that could turn into a meditative or sort of kind of preaching uh, one, let's say, that has uh, as an object, um, you know, of interest actually a real life, right? Um, he also, you know, for example, a character could be become this exemplar symbol of virtue or vice, or it can be even be a ridiculous, right? Um, so he's criticizing really modern times, and um, th there are certain s considerations we can draw about human vices uh, uh, from his work, from Ophelia's work, pointing at um, essentially a polemical aim, like he also in a didascalic fashion, uh, sometimes explicitly personal instead, and he, mm, you know, he built this type of satire that was one of the most vivid creations of Latin literature. Contributing to it was the old actic comedy and even more the stoic cynic um, debate of Hellenistic Greece. Cratitis of Tibis was moralizing, making a parody of Homer in Examiners, for example. And to the progressive definition of the satirical content, um, because surely Lucilius took a lot of time to develop this. There was the, uh, in parallel, the conquest of the, the definitive form of the composition in examiners. From the fragments that remain, we can um, reconstruct, um, albeit the traditional order of, of the work, um, albeit old, I mean, I mean close to the times, doesn't reflect the cr the actual chronology of the composition. This kind of evolution uh, of a style that goes from these typical meters of Ennius satire to in, in, in Pacovius also one, which is the polymetry as we've seen with the prevalence of jambic and trochaic verses, for example, from between the book 26 and 29, to the elegiac distic, not important me meter, uh, 
in the 22nd book, but also perhaps in the 23rd and 25th, to the books 1 to 21 and, and 30 that are in examiners instead. Lucilius is rich of expressive possibilities, he has this varying tones um, that uh, basically d date back to Plato's tradition. Right, the it's kind of vigorous and sincere in you know in the attack in in the portrait. Um, Lucilius attacked basically all the greatest men of his time, from uh, the democratic uh, the Democrats, let's say, of Gaius Cassius, Marcus Papirius Carbo, to the aristocrats of the anti-Scipionic faction, such as Quintus Opimius, uh, Lucius Aurelius Cotta, um, Scaevola the Augur. Uh, Quintus Metellus Macedonicus, Lucius Cornelius Lentulus Lupus, and he united to the political moralistic polemic, also the philosophical one. He probably approached um, the academy, um, and also from from a literary point of view, with this uh, wealth of say richness of interest and of culture. But Lucilius' strong moralism was not without completely without you know, limits in this regard. His satire m lacked somewhat that, that ethical wealth that um, yet the, the, the ideal of the Hellenizing aristocracy among which he lived was representing, right? So Lucidus' satires had a great fame in Latinity as is demonstra demonstrated not just uh, by the following history of satire, for example, Horace and the satires of imperial age, Persis, Jovenel, uh, depended uh, and or however were influenced by Lucilius' work. But also uh, the, uh, the various mentions and, you know, praise, uh, praising that are to be found in Velaeus Patericulus, for example, Plinius the Elder, and even in Quintilian that uh, objectively point out the importance of this order uh, in in the Latin literary tradition, um, then what can we say uh, here? Uh, so, I think what what is important here is that the Hellenization that has deeply influenced the uh, the Roman world, and uh, we we talk about this both in material culture and, and kind of ideal culture, right? Uh, it's this connection between philosophy, religion, and morals that go all together at the time, and we've already seen ma in many ways that uh, in um, during the third century there were deities and cults um, penetrating in Italy and Rome from Greece, from the Hellenistic world, uh, broadly met. And in this um, respect, the Second Punic War, as we've seen, was uh, was seen as especially this moment of the, the sensibility, the evolution of s religious sensibility of the Romans as well, right? Um, and which as is accompanied, as we were saying at the beginning of the video, by this sort of national uh, reaction that is to be manifested, especially in, in the occasion of the famous scandal of the Bacchanalia in eight, uh, 886 BC. This is fairly old. In, in time, and um, so basically, the, the, the scandal. There were, to make it simple, there were some certain denounces born out of an episode that had come into uh, question. You know the the licity of the Bacchic mysteries. Uh, the Senate basically was pushed to take m repressive measures. that were extremely severe at this time. More than seven thousand people um, among men and women alike were, were involved in the investigations and more than 6,000 people were actually imprisoned or condemned to death, especially in southern Italy and in Rome, um, just like as in Etruria as well. And this episode actually shows the influence of the Dionysiac mysticism that is very important in this regard because it brings to Rome a kind of a... I mean, it, it's difficult to discuss about this without mentioning where, you know, even the the Roman tradition had come from it. Say, at this time, the Romans had developed a kind of a very stern and austere um, 
moral tradition among the aristocracy that embodied at that point the unity of the system. Like up to the Second Punic War, this system had held. But let's say th at this point it was collapsing, and the Dionysiac cults were essentially about Ubers, about this letting yourself go without any kind of uh, refrain um, that actually was part of the ancient, even of the same ancient concept of virtus. If you really look at the prehistory of it in the Indo European tradition, that there is always this mix between the, the Apollinus, let's say, and the Di Dionysiac. Um, this idea that there is a f blind fury, for example, that hits, that has to do, well, in the Roman tradition at this point with other gods, uh, it's not about Bacchus uh, slash Dionysus, um, it's it's something else. But uh, the Romans at this time were, you know, at, at this type of, myst of Dionysiac mysticism was essentially taking over as a thing to itself, right? And it had a huge su success. Even think about the, uh, you know, the Romans at this point were ruling the Mediterranean, so that they were really thinking to be the best guys around. They were having a lot of power. They had crushed Carthage. Um, they would go on with uh, essentially uh, defeating. For had they actually had already defeated the the, in the first Macedonian, um, actually in one of the Battle of Cynoscephali, right? Uh, they had already defeated the the, the Macedonian family, so they they, f they had lost great part of the inhibition. You can think about the Roman, even the Roman elites and upper kind of middle class have joining this kind of um, disease of abundance, right? Like in this Dionysiac stance of you know about sensuality, about letting yourself go in a world of pleasure, fundamentally. So this was incompatible with the the austerity and of the Roman, of the public affair of Rome, like of the rest public property was against the other gods, it was es essentially a um, a denial of certain values that already at the time were conceived to have made Rome Greek. Um, and this in fact, you, you can see the success that such ideas enjoy, uh, you know, had in Rome, uh, simply by the spread of other um, currents of other philosophies, for example, um, to the same mystic current of the Dionysiac mysticism used to be connected the spread of Orphism and Pythagorism that were a bit different. Orphism was connected definitely to the Dionysiac cults as well. Pythagorism was quite a bit different thing um, and it was um, this was doctrine of purity associated to as ascetic practices. Um, so this is partly varied, and they it enjoyed a, a certain success in Rome as well. Um, but th this thing goes on, right? In this spiritual current that looks at Greece, Greece, the, the fortune of the philosophical schools, those representatives coming, f especially from places like Athens, like Rhodes, attracted ever more, uh, especially young people r of the aristocratic. Um, environment, right? This is very important because this explains a lot, even the further Hellenization of the Roman ruling class in the pre in the following centuries, right? Um, and it started like this. Uh, think about Stoicism that actually had a lot in uh, in common with the ancient stern moral traditions, but not completely. Um, this was animated by Panetius of Rhodes, that was all an important figure that uh, essentially was preaching against the corruption of customs um, and the the practice of virtue or rather of the four cardinal virtues that is knowledge, justice, self-control and courage, right? So these were fitting broadly with essentially with the Roman system of values. So um, this would eventually stem even those uh, in part conservative kind of republican parties of the um, optimatus later on um, that that at that point had become demagogues, just like the popularis if we're talking about the first century BC but they were basing themselves on this idea of that the Republic was all about justice, shared, collective um, you know, duty and so on, so had a huge success even to the death like everything happens you have essentially to, to stick to you know, to, to resist to show your your backbone, etc., and um, this 
this was liked by many Romans as well. From the other side, it was Epicureanism as well that knew its own success at the end, especially of the second century BC and the first one BC with Lucretius. Um, parallelly to this intrusion, we can say, of the lifestyle, uh, um, Roman lifestyle of, of these Hellenic models, we see in the second century BC an important evolution of customs. And this transformation of customs in the course of the last two centuries of the Republican era uh, is present also in the element, the element that has, um, in fact, m prevalently interested the ancient authors like Polybius before, eventually Sallustius, Seneca, Diodorus, Siculus, um, for not talking about Cato, right, that um, had kind of re competed to denounce the desire of pleasure as one of the major causes of the decline of the Roman Republic, right? It was uh, scoped at the time as such that naturally, if we, ha we, we were here to make an historical political analysis of, <laughs> of this judgment, it's uh, it was propaganda, of course, but there. It's interesting because, incidentally, lots of people still believe this faith <laughs> even today, right? That there were all these great morals that eventually were betrayed. Well, of course, there were changes, significant changes, significant, but it was all about what was at the top, whether it was shared or just one guy, like the monarchy that the empire actually represents, um, the principate, even in part, uh, substantially, right? So, mm, but. We don't have to talk about this now, but just bear in mind that these ideals were all, let's say, giving voice to certain veins of Roman um, morals that had or always been there, that partly, in fact, the same Greeks had shared. Like, as Indo-Europeans, this, this idea, however, that there had to be an integrity of, say, it, it was all shared by, by many other peoples, including, I don't know, you know, all the, the, the tribes of Central Europe, etc., um, that was pouring in different ways, in di through different channels, and especially at this time, being expressed literally speaking. Um, it, Rome had been up to, in fact, the Punic Wars largely, in this sense, kind of traditionalistic, oriented, in a very stern way, and it, it was all about essentially oral traditions and of a system that, however, was morally shared, like among the Aristocracy, there was a functionality in it, despite of the differences that naturally occurred, but um, it, it had really been working. From really the Second Punic War onwards, too much had changed. So, those who had believed in, in the previous models, or at least were trying to make a way in politics by um, even stressing the, um, you know, their belonging to a certain um, tradition that at that point wasn't evidently quite followed anymore, but was romantically um, re, you know, revived ideally. Well, what was very important, and th there, w there were lots of classes to which even these newcomers, essentially, in politics were coming from that um, were, that I mean, that they actually were, which needed to show now that they're f Fate to the to the ideal. They, they had to be fit to the new position that they had come to acquire, even if they came from a background that, ironically, was exactly the one that had, you know, uh, not been part of the old senatorial elite of pre-Second Punic War. Um, but it is true that there was uh, an Italic background um, from which, mm, of course, let's say. Rome was perceived as the great corrupted place, right? As Sallust would say, you know, that you know, a city that you know if could be both if or just anyone had ever found the money, right? This was a cliche, a stereotype in some ways, uh, but it was also realistic in the measure in which um, Rome definitely represented a essentially a business place for some of the greatest landowners of the World Republic. They had an enormous amount of land in Italy. They were keeping expanding essentially in it because the laws, the Roman laws of the time didn't basically put an end of the amount of um, um, uh, a limit to the amount of land you could occupy, right? Always given it was public land, but if you had the means you could still work there, right? 
and the guys who made the laws were essentially the same people who occupied the land in that regard. But maybe it was among the ta and this was the the, the Latif, uh, you know, the, the the great estate land owners, right? There was then a kind of a more active middle class from which there were lots of people who emerged to enter even in the Senate that were kind of more dynamic, but at the same time they were more traditionalist because they came from a background from the Italian interland that was substantially much more traditionalist in that regard and especially for what concerned the Italic part proper still so like the um, you know that the were much less liberal than the, the Roman aristocracy was so there was a, a relative capability of co constantly fueling, fueling the this myth also because the ele the Italic electorate was if was not liberal at all like there were largely conservative and they didn't they, they took things pretty seriously still um, in many ways from a moral point of view um, so th this is complex may I promise we will discuss this in another occasion but not now uh, the important now is that the, the, the it was mm, evident that it was a perception of the decay of moral costumes right as it had always happened basically <laughs> in every historical era about every single society um, we can see already since Cato uh, during his censorship let's say um, that uh, he had taken for example uh, hence Cato cancer like you know uh, this mm, that's where censorship in the term he use it comes from like because he had taken uh, this was magistrate who was in charge even of correct in certain habits. For example, he had uh, Cato himself had taken during the censorship measures against the uh, luxury of uh, women in clothing. You know, it was you know the sumptuary laws were were pretty widespread in historically speaking. You know, the, you, you couldn't wear too much expensive stuff. Um, this hit even the luxury uh, of the table, right? Um, there are even certain <laughs> ironic things. For example, in 161, there was a law that prohibited the, you know, the the wagoning of partridges for culinary uses. <laughs> like that's kind of funny. Um, and in fact, it was pretty much mm, fell in satire of the time. Na naturally, Cato had an agenda on his own. He, he has he was involved in this. It had it made a sense. But naturally, he was criticized in part even literally speaking and we have evidence of this um, but the, the the general feeling that it was a decadence is to be found for example even in Sallustius. Sallustius is very good author he writes this kind of historicistic and already romantic melancholic idea of what Rome had to be. Excuse me I drink a little bit before we go on. Compared to to ancient times, let's say, to older times at least. And in fact, he uh, denounced with uh, even greater force the moral reasons of the Republic in the De um, Coniurazione Catilinae, you know, this work in which he attacks not just the, um, the increase of luxury and the desire of pleasure, but also this in fact, r falling religious piety, like th this contempt towards the gods, as he puts that, and the corruption of men of power. Like, Rome was, as we often recalled in every circumstance, as a political system, was solely found on religious basis. There, there was no other base conceivable at the time. So, everything was an insult to the gods themselves, and objectively, the Republic, like, as power was, uh, powerful as it could be it was pretty pretty tormented. Like we, there was no need to to recall what happened, especially starting from the from the uh, the thirties, but even before, from the mid second century BC onwards, in you know, till Augustian times, like it was a pretty a, a big mess, right? Um, continuous wars of every kind, rebellions, uh, etc. So it wasn't an easy moment, uh, but. Um, there is this, for example, Sallustius that we can maybe discuss another time because he's a big author. In maybe now we're driving away essentially from from the time, but 
uh, Sallustius was contemporary to Caesar, right? He had lived himself through the political experiences of Sulla and Pompey, the horrible civil wars that would have, you know, um, covered Rome in blood and Italy as well. Um, and uh, he had observed the political crisis of the last century of the Republic, and he had known how to describe it, right? So. Um, we are very thankful to these authors because they really show us a world that in spite of the hypocrisy of those who were criticizing the same system from which they essentially um, l had come, I mean they still lived in fully right there is no like the world political propaganda was about that it was about sticking to the morality to the religious respect to the, the, this greater romanity this virtue that had made Rome great right it's always like that ideally you know what do you want to stick to, to you openly corrupt morals no but it's evident that the Republic had come to that point exactly because something had gone seriously wrong right and humans do pretty stupid things in general but there is also um, a reason why why this happens it, they had their reasons as well um, so in conclusion we can say that in um, let's say at the side of a sort of renaissance of, l of the letters and of the arts uh, the conquests brought to Rome the, the ferments of serious disorders of political and social life um, especially from a traditional point of view and they created the conditions of this in fact um, twisting of traditional values right and everything will explode in fact in the last century before our era in that you know this now we've today we've gone too far maybe we have had um <laughs> you know a long um landing uh, towards the end but I it's important because it's really part of a whole um channel of whole story right it, it, this thing kept evolving and and the history of literature is dramatically fascinating to to get the, the shades of that in the absence of of other historical evidence that unfortunately is either lost or formalized in other ways that are very meager like if you know Roman culture you know that how uh, concise the Romans were usually so it's very important for us that part of their elite got Hellenized and that it patronized uh, authors of um, of this kind of Hellenic background because this brought in certain instruments that allowed to to actually depict what uh, even those things that um, are are unknown to us most of the times like um, the tr a true Roman would have not never written like that like even look at what Caesar wrote about that Caesar wrote about a political military history about ethnography about his was very different uh, from the moralizing character of uh, this form of works but it's exactly even th from satire from comedy but even from tragedy you, you can't assume what what was really troubling in, in thinking like even th the Roman society etc in fact the uh, from the second century the mid second century we lose track of what was the contact with the people we stop knowing largely what the people really felt and knew and liked that's why works like the one of Plautus are of dramatic importance because they show us um, at a popular level what culture was 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 about at the time what uh, among classes that would classes would soon lose their their actual weight in, in the picture like they were always very important but they wouldn't have basically any uh, voice actually speaking for them if not uh, in um, like in a patronizing political, you know, propagandistic and patronizing way, right? Later on, with these uh, classes had been essentially excluded from the poli you know, from the from the rule as such, um, and it's well, okay, maybe now that there is no need to expand on this, but just remembering that it's today we we just mm, made. A a little bill of these considerations but we have to expand this massively in in terms of um, of um, 
of this story because it's very complicated. This is just, just too superficial. What, whatever, excuse me, I, I got distracted towards the end. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.